Amen. Thank you, brothers, for praying. Good to see everybody back. Welcome. I'm glad you're here this evening for our evening service. Um, hope you had a wonderful afternoon of fellowship. We had a great time of fellowship, being able to fellowship with Hannah's family from Wyoming. And although uh, separated by many miles, uh, one faith, one baptism, one Lord, uh, it's a joy to fellowship with God's people uh, wherever they may come from. And we're grateful for that this afternoon and hope you had a good afternoon of fellowship as well. Uh, it's good to see you back for our evening service. I want to keep encouraging you to uh, come. I'm grateful that you're here and we want to keep placing ourselves under the preaching of God's word. Right? God works through his word to grow us up in the faith, uh, to mature us in the faith. And um, that's... Uh, you can benefit from videos, you can benefit from a podcast, but there's nothing like being with God's people, praying with God's people, submitting their, themselves to the Word of God with God's people in the corporate worship of God's people. Uh, God works through that in a special way to uh, mature His people and grow His people, and we are grateful for it. So it's good to have you back. We are back in the book of Judges this evening. So Judges chapter 6 is our text, and we're again uh, examining the call of Gideon. And this is part two in this brief section of text that runs from verse 11 through verse 24. So turn with me there in your Bibles to Judges chapter 6, verses 11 through 24. And let's consider again tonight in part two the call of Gideon. So Judges chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. So Gideon said to him, verse 13, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, and why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our father told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us. Delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him in verse 15, O my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Then he said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. Do not depart from here, I pray, until I come back to you and bring my offering and set it before you. And he said, I will wait until you come back. So Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and he brought them out to him under the terebinth tree and presented them. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat, the unleavened bread, and fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. And the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord, and so Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. And so Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is peace. To this day it is still in Ophrah of the Abia's rites. This is the word of God, Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Uh, Father in heaven, Lord, we are grateful for your word, grateful the, for the blessing of sitting under your word and learning at your feet. So grateful, Lord, for the lessons here that you've taught us uh, in the book of Judges, and in particular now as we consider uh, the Midianite menace and the call of Gideon. We're very grateful for these lessons. We're grateful, Lord, that you give these examples to us for our admonition. They are examples to us, and we want to learn uh, from the examples that you've given us. So help us, Lord, to understand. Help us to learn these lessons and apply them to our hearts and minds. And help us, Lord, to live for you according to them. Uh, and we're grateful, Lord, for this lesson of Gideon and what it is teaching us about uh, genuine faith and what it means to trust in you. So, Lord, be with us now as we consider this text. Um, be with us as we think through these things. 
Help us to understand, Lord, and then help us to worship, to praise you, and to obey you uh, as we should. For your glory, God, we pray these things. Amen. Well, again, the title of our sermon this evening is The Call of Gideon. This is part two, Judges chapter 6, verses 11 through 24. What we want to do tonight in Judges chapter 6, 11, verses 11 through 24, part two here of this little series in Judges 6, is to essentially put ourselves in the sandals of Gideon. We want to put ourselves in Gideon's shoes as he has this encounter with the angel of the Lord in Judges chapter 6. And this is in preparation for Gideon being called to deliver God's people out of the hand of their enemies, the Midianites. Now, when we last, when we last left Gideon in Judges chapter 6, Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press, hiding out from the Midianite menace in verse 11. And that's when, in verse 11, a mysterious figure appears to him, unknown to Gideon at the time, but known to us from the text, we know him to be the angel of the Lord. This is a Christophany, as we discussed last Lord's Day, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, all things said, when Gideonite meets the angel of the Lord, he would probably prefer a do-over on this entire conversation, right? All things said, the conversation didn't go that well in the beginning. Gideon definitely got off on the wrong foot. Now, it appears as though if we read sort of in the white spaces, if you will, between the lines of the text, Gideon had a bit of a tone to his response to the angel of the Lord as he enters into this conversation. Gideon seems a bit embittered about his circumstances, a bit embittered about where the children of Israel find themselves at this point in history. There's definitely a tone to Gideon's response in these opening verses. Now, he certainly isn't seeing his circumstances the way that he should. He's certainly not seeing the circumstances now uh, for the children of Israel the way that he should. The Lord had sent a prophet to his people. He didn't immediately send a deliverer. He sends them a prophet. He sends them his word. That prophet would have been all over Israel preaching this message from chapter 6, verse 8. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, I brought you out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all who oppressed you, and drove them out before you, and gave you their land. The Lord did that in His grace and in His mercy to His covenant people. He brought them out of the, the iron furnace of Egypt. And also He said, I said to you in verse 10, I am the Lord your God. In other words, we've entered into covenant together. I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites. In other words, don't bow down to those gods. Don't worship those pagan, worthless, mute, deaf, dumb gods. I am the Lord your God. But, verse 10, you have not obeyed my voice. That's the condition now that the children of Israel find themselves in. A disobedient people now under judgment. Now the message of the prophet was clear. The message clearly ties their current circumstances to the judgment of God on their disobedience. It's the very same message that the Lord delivered to them at Bochim, right? The place of weeping from Judges chapter 2. It's the very same message the Lord delivered to them at the giving of the law back in Leviticus chapter 26, back in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And now it's the very same message that He gave them when He established His covenant with them. And yet, despite that message, despite its Repetition, it's been repeated over and over again now to Gideon. We find Gideon in a bit of an emotional outburst here in verse 13, saying, If the Lord is with us, then why then has all this happened to us? Like, Gideon, have you not put two and two together yet? This is exactly what the Lord said would happen to you if you fall into sin and you worship those pagan worthless idols. Where are all His miracles, which our fathers told us about, right? The Lord has forsaken us, and the Lord has delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. That last part is true. <laughs> it was the Lord who delivered them into the hands of the Midianites. But the Lord hasn't forsaken them. What's the purpose behind God's judgment? What's the intention? When God delivers them into the hands of the, of the Midianites, what does the Lord want to see? He wants to see their repentance. He wants to see them turn back to Him. And the Lord does this for their good. Now, Gideon says all this, right? He's, 
making these statements. He's a bit embittered. He's a bit perplexed, it would seem, over their current condition. But all the while, all the while, Gideon's family is back in Ophrah worshiping Baal. (laughs) There's a Baal altar set up in town and an Asherah pole set up next to it. Like we so often shamefully do, don't we? If we acknowledge, we think for a moment about our own circumstances, as we so often shamefully do ourselves, Gideon here is failing to connect the dots. He doesn't see God's sovereign hand over all these circumstances. He's refusing to acknowledge his sin, right? He's refusing to acknowledge the sin of the covenant people of God now in this period of the judges. He's refusing to acknowledge God's righteous justice in their circumstances. He's a bit like a child, isn't he, in how he responds to his circumstances. Have you ever gone to discipline your children and they've done something wrong and when you go to discipline them or you confront them in their sin, the little heathen, uh, they get mad at you. (laughs) You ever notice that? Don't eat the cookies. Don't eat the cookies. Don't eat them. And you turn your back for a moment, you turn back around, and there's cookie all over their face. And you say, what are you doing eating the cookies? And they get mad at you because you've caught them in their sin. Gideon's having a similar kind of a reaction here. He's angry. God has forsaken us. He's not shown up for us like he showed up for our fathers. Why has all this come upon us? Why has all this happened to us? And yet Gideon's got family back home worshiping Baal. Right? The children of Israel are worshiping idols. Gideon's not connecting the dots here, and he's having a bit of an emotional outburst. Now, like a mom or a dad would be with that child, uh, very patient, (laughs) very compassionate, the Lord explains that Gideon will be the one that he will use to deliver his people Israel from out of the hands, from out from under the hand of the Midianites. He reassures Gideon in verse 16, listen, and the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Surely I will be with you. The Lord graciously repeats His promise. The Lord is with you, verse 12. And surely I will be with you, verse 16. You're going to save Israel from the Midianites, verse 14. You shall defeat the Midianites as one man, verse 16. Right? The Lord is calling Gideon into service. He graciously comes to Gideon, even in his present condition, which is not so good. And what does, in this situation, Gideon, what does Gideon have to do? What does Gideon have to do? Gideon has to respond in faith. Gideon is expected to respond in faith. Gideon is expected to walk by faith and not by sight. The difficulty here is that Gideon, up to this point, has been walking almost entirely by sight and not by faith. He's got his eyes down in his circumstances. He's looking at the way that things are on the ground, so to speak, and he's not considering that a sovereign God rules over the affairs of men and rules in particular over his circumstances even now. He's not trusting the Lord. Because his sight is glued to his circumstances, his sight is obstructed. You see, Gideon believes that he sees things as they are. Does Gideon see things as they are? No. He's blinded. His sight is obstructed. He hasn't connected the dots. The lack of faith, the lack of perspective is blinding him to the truth, and that in large part because he's focused on his circumstances and he's not focused on the Lord. He's walking by sight. This is the way I see things. He's not walking by faith. Because of that now, he's lost all true perspective on his circumstances. He can no longer judge rightly the way that things truly are. And he says to himself, woe is me, doesn't he? How did I get here? How did we wind up this way? He's incapable of seeing things as they really are. He's incapable of seeing himself, acknowledging his own sin. He doesn't see his own sinfulness against God. He's incapable of seeing God and God's perspective on things. The foolish mind of the faithless is darkened and without understanding. When we don't consider our circumstances from the perspective of God's Word or from the perspective of biblical faith, 
then our understanding becomes darkened. We become fools who profess to be wise. We must turn back to the Lord. We must turn back to His Word and walk by faith. If you ever find yourself in difficult circumstances in the same way, what do, what do we do? We go to God's Word. We think about the Lord's intention, the Lord's purposes for this trial that we find ourselves in, and we think about Scripture. <laughs> we think about what the Lord would have us think about. We look to His Word. We look to Him. We turn from sin. God says, I want you to be holy. I want you to pray. I want you to depend upon me. And the Lord promises, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We just have to remember to think rightly, right? Oftentimes, we need our minds and our hearts readjusted. And often, when we have a heart and mind readjustment, it comes through pain, the difficulty of our circumstances. We often grow most in the soil of our sin or in the soil of our mistakes or in the soil of our circumstances. Now, Gideon here has every reason in the world to take the Lord at His word and to go out in faith, doesn't he? Every reason to believe the Lord. The Lord had delivered them so many times before. He knew about all the miracles that his fathers told him about, didn't he? He knew about those miracles. He knew that God had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. But Gideon needs remediation here. He needs a remedial course in faith, as we often do. And you could read this text and maybe think to yourself, um, I'm a little frustrated with Gideon, or I'm a little aggravated, annoyed with Gideon right now at this point, how he's not seeing things or how he responded to that circumstance. But listen, that's you. <laughs> you respond that way, and I respond that way too often. Too many times we'd rather not admit. This is us here. We need reminding often from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 59, verse 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save nor is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. We need to turn back to the Lord, and the Lord will hear. This is what our sin does. Our sin clouds our judgment. It blinds us to the truth, and we end up not being able to see straight. We can't see things clearly as they are. Now Gideon still doesn't clearly understand at this point who he's speaking with. He may think that he does, but nevertheless, Gideon decides to put him to the test, right? Is this you, Lord, who's speaking with me? So he says in verse 17, look at verse 17 with me. He said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. Do not depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. And he said, can you imagine, right? The Lord says, I'll wait until you come back. <laughs> and the Lord waits on Gideon. So this nagging, weak faith that Gideon is sort of exhibiting here is going to follow Gideon around for a while. He's going to end up putting God to the test again later in this chapter. But here, Gideon, in testing the Lord, has two primary concerns. One, he wants to confirm that he has God's favor, right? Do I really have your favor? Do I really have your favor? Two, he wants to confirm that God is going to be with him in the work. Is it really you, Lord, who are saying this to me? Am I, is it really you who are with me? Okay. Then he says to the Lord, Now, Lord, you wait here until I go and get things ready. I'm going to put you to the test. I'm going to develop and plan this test. I'm going to go and put this test together. You wait here until I get the test ready. Right, Gideon has lost his mind. <laughs> Gideon doesn't realize who he's speaking with. If Gideon... If Gideon when Gideon realizes who he's speaking with, we'll see a biblical response to that realization, okay? Here, Gideon doesn't get it, and he's acting a bit like a spoiled, entitled child, isn't he? Now, what we see on the part of the Lord here is great patience, great patience. The Lord says, I'll wait until you come back. But it's also, isn't it, compassion? It's grace. It's pity, the depths to which we fall in our lack of faith and how patient and compassionate and good the Lord is toward us. And if Gideon had the faith of a mustard seed, there'd be a wake of dead Midianites in his path already. The Lord is great in patience and compassion and grace and goodness and loving kindness toward us. But here, this is going to take some time. 
So the angel of the Lord sits and waits. Look at verse 19. So Gideon went in there and prepared a young goat. Just think about what it takes to prepare a young goat to eat a meal. It's going to take a long time. You take a young goat and have to skin that goat and clean that goat and gut that goat and prepare that goat. It's going to take a while. Gideon went in and he prepared this young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. An ephah, I want to say if I'm correct, is about 22 liters of flour. This is no small amount of flour. This is a huge amount of flour. This is going to be a lot of bread that's being made here. The meat, verse 19, he put in a basket. Basket. He put the broth in a pot, and he brought them out to him under the terebinth tree and presented them. Now, Gideon said that he was going to bring his offering. This is an offering to the Lord. That's the, what, what Gideon intends for it to be. So it's not just any goat. It's a young goat particularly chosen. It's not just a little bit of bread. It's a huge amount of bread. And remember the circumstances. The Midianites have left them destitute. They have very little left. The Midianites have come in and have stolen everything. So this was quite an undertaking for Gideon. He's already beginning to exhibit some faith here. This would have been a costly endeavor. So Gideon means business. This is a costly sacrifice. So Gideon brings the offering. Look at verse 20. The angel of God then said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. So Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire rose out of the rock, consumed the meat and the unleavened bread, and the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. When the offering that Gideon brings is consumed by fire, that indicates that the offering is accepted. The offering is accepted by the angel of the Lord. Gideon certainly has found favor in the Lord's sight. That consuming of the offering has proven it to Gideon. Otherwise, the fire would have consumed Gideon and not the offering. Do you see? Gideon has found favor in the sight of the Lord. The Lord had clearly said that it was so. The Lord is with you. And now the Lord clearly clearly shows that it is so, that the Lord is with him. Now there's a sense, one sense, in which this test is good and somewhat understandable. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 15. The simple believes every word, but the prudent considers well his steps. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You know, if, if many charismatics would simply apply that one principle, it would mean the virtual end of charismania, right? The things they attribute to the Spirit of God that are no way attributable to the Spirit of God, that would all end. Study your Bible, right? Study your Bible. Apply the Word of God. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Word, the Logos, has visited us with His Word. The first Word first came through the prophets and then through the Lord Himself. And so many professing Christians today refuse to heed His Word. They would say, right, I feel led. I feel led. I've been been praying and I feel, what is that? (laughs) We can't make decisions like that. I feel like God is telling me. And then what do you do? You put God to the test. The sign that you want me to take that job is that they offer that job to me. (laughs) And I feel led to take the... It hasn't crossed your mind that maybe God is testing you with a job offer that you shouldn't take. (laughs) But I feel led, right? Or if you want me to take that job offer, Lord, it'll be for exactly the right amount of money that I need. (laughs) And you don't consider God's Word. Listen, we don't need a sign. We don't need a sign. Peter says, you have the prophetic Word confirmed, which what? You do well to heed. You do well to heed it. It may be very likely that God is testing you by putting you in those circumstances. 
That's not the case for Gideon here, right? He's being told to take the job. This isn't an offer. This is the draft. Gideon is being told this is what's going to happen. But the Lord is very gracious. The Lord is very patient with Gideon's weak faith. He allows the test to go forward. The Lord validates his word with a sign. And then he consumes Gideon's offering with fire upon the rock. Now, not unlike, if you remember the test that Elijah uh, presented with the Baal, the pagan Baal worshipers, Mount Carmel, right? The deranged prophets of Baal. Fire devours the sacrifice. In this case, fire from beneath, from the rock, devours the sacrifice. And the test is proven. The Lord is building here Gideon's faith. The Lord's building Gideon's faith, preparing Gideon for service. Gideon's going to need this built-up faith in order to do what the Lord is asking him to do. Look with me now at verse 22. Now Gideon, when he consumed the sacrifice, right? Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And so Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. We spoke about that a little bit last week. When the fire consumes the offering on the rock, it's as if Gideon's sight is restored, right? As if Gideon, his eyes are opened, and suddenly Gideon realizes who it is. It's an encounter with God Almighty, and the truth of Almighty God comes flooding in upon his soul, and Gideon comes to an acknowledgement. Not only of who he is, the one whom I've been speaking with, but who Gideon is as well. At once he is like Isaiah in the temple of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6, right? Smoke filling that place, the posts of the doors shaking at the voice of the Lord, and Isaiah cries out, what does he cry? Woe is me, right? I'm undone. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, what was it, Isaiah chapter 6, that caused Isaiah's fear? It was a sight of the holiness of God in light of a crushing reality or a crushing realization of his own sin. Those two truths, and Isaiah is undone, right? Isaiah is undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Alas, O Lord God, I'm going to die, right? I'm undone. The experience here in verse 22, 23 is the same for Gideon. It's the same for Gideon. Fire comes out of the rock, not only consumes the sacrifice, but lights as it is the fires within Gideon's own dead heart. It's an encounter with the Holy One of Israel, Yahweh, unlike anything that Gideon was prepared for. And what does Gideon do? He cries out in fear. Alas, O Lord God, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. You know, the people of Israel, if you remember that account, cried out to Moses in the wilderness. God had led them out of Egypt. He leads them to Sinai where he's going to give them his law. He's going to enter into covenant with them there. They're out there with, with Moses in the wilderness and they cry out to Moses after seeing lightning on the mountain, thundering and flashes, the voice of God pounding in their ears loud, Right? And the people cry out, you speak with us and we'll hear. But let not God speak with us lest we die. Lest we die. The prevailing cavalier attitude of many regarding the worship of God. The irreverence that often associates the thoughts, speech, and worship of people who profess to be Christians, that cavalier attitude is not due their understanding, but is due their ignorance. Do you see? A familiarity that breeds irreverence is not due to their understanding, but due their ignorance. It's not due their familiarity with them, it's due to their lack of knowledge of him, right? They don't know him. It's not due to their own holiness of life, but it's due to their sin and rebellion against Him, that they don't see things aright. When Gideon thought that he knew, 
Gideon acted a certain way, didn't he? He responded a certain way. There's a certain tone in the way that he's interacting with the angel of the Lord. He makes the angel of the Lord sit there and wait. He interacts with him at that level. Being a little perturbed, frankly, at the fact that God hasn't shown up for them. What has he done for me lately, right? In this conversation with the angel of the Lord. When God shows up, Gideon receives his sight, so to speak. He sees things more rightly. He gains a new perspective. And what happens? Gideon becomes crushed and God becomes holy and glorified, right? Magnificent. God is seen in majesty. God is seen in holiness. And I am crushed like a worm. Why? Because of my own sin. And what is Gideon's response? I'm going to die. Alas, oh Lord God, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Irreverence for God. A lack of holiness. A lack of awe and wonder at who He is and what He's done. Is a fruit of blindness. Is a fruit of ignorance. It's a fruit of arrogance. It's the fruit of unbelief. It's the fruit of not knowing His Word. It's the fruit of not knowing Him. And we get such irreverent worship as a result. Such irreverent familiarity. Such irreverent Christian, quote-unquote, so-called Christian lives. Love and devotion and holiness of life, a sober mind, self-control, are the fruits of our knowledge of Him applied by the Spirit of God. You have an encounter with Almighty God, who He is and what He's done. Where do we encounter Almighty God? We encounter Him on the pages of His Word. We learn of Him. We understand of Him. We come to be illuminated, enlightened with uh, what the Word of God reveals about Him. And as we have knowledge of the Holy One shed abroad in our hearts, we respond with conviction over sin, respond with self-deprecating humility, seeing ourselves as we are and seeing Himself more as He is. What does that produce? What does that knowledge of Him produce? It produces love, devotion. Why doesn't it produce fear? <laughs> slavish fear, fleeing from him fear. Why does it produce fear that wants to cling to him, that is love, that shows love for him, that is devoted to him? Because he is our savior, our deliverer. He is forgiving. He is loving. He is kind. We have the gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ is why. His spirit is why. A proper understanding is forged in a consideration of our own wretchedness and his righteousness, right? Our, an understanding of our own depravity and His own purity. The Lord has said of the wicked that there is no fear of God before their eyes. No fear of God before their eyes. In Gideon's prior interaction with the angel of the Lord, there's no fear before his eyes. Gideon responds in the way that he does. When fire consumes that sacrifice on the rock, Gideon is struck with fear. I have fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What does Gideon begin to get? Gideon begins to get wisdom. What is it that would keep someone with that understanding from crying out in response with the Israelites in the wilderness? Listen, you talk to us, but we don't want to hear from God anymore. I don't want to hear from God lest I die. What would keep us from that response? What would keep them from hiding themselves, as Revelation says, right? Hiding themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains saying, fall on us. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the land. That's not God's people who are saying that. That's the wicked who are saying that. They're hiding themselves in caves and mountains and rocks saying, fall on us. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Who is able to stand? What's the difference in those two responses? The difference is faith in the Savior. Faith in the Savior. God is a deliverer. 
God is a Savior. He has sent His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world to seek and to save that which is lost, to save sinners. And we are sinners, amen? We need His mercy. We need His grace. The fact that He gave His only Son to save sinners, we should cling to Him in faith, amen? Throw your arms around the cross. He has come to save sinners. Faith in God's only provision for our sin. Faith in who He is and what He has done. Listen to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil that is His flesh, Having a high priest over the house of God, let us then draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. If you will flee to Him, He is forgiving. You'll find forgiveness with Him. If you'll flee to Him, you'll find cleansing with Him. If you flee to Him, you'll find love and compassion and grace and mercy and kindness and steadfast covenant loving kindness toward His people, right? It won't be striving after the law that will cause us to draw near. It won't be the preaching of the law that causes us to draw near. It won't be the giving of the law that causes us to draw near. Why? Because from the law comes the knowledge of sin. And the knowledge of sin crashing in upon our hearts, in upon our minds, should send us to the Savior, cause us to flee to Christ. The preaching of the law should drive us to despair of any merit of our own, cause us to despair over our own sin, and cause us to see our need for the gospel. We cannot be holy in the flesh of our own efforts. We need Jesus Christ. Amen? No amount of law-keeping will bring peace with God. We need peace with God, and that only comes through the shed blood of His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So seek peace with Him through the gospel, right? Turn from your sin. Trust Him alone. How does the Lord respond here in Judges chapter 6? Does He rebuke Gideon? Does He chastise him for his weak faith? Gideon your faith is despicable. Get out of my sight. All right? Is that what the Lord does? Does he press the law upon his conscience, condemn him for his disobedience? No, Gideon sits under the judgment of God under the Midianites, right? It would not have been unjust for God to dismiss Gideon as a sinner. It wouldn't be unjust. The Lord doesn't do that. How does the Lord respond? With grace and mercy and compassion by preaching to him peace. Look at verse 23. Then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. And how gracious, how kind, how merciful, how patient, how good, right? The grace of God. Peace be with you, Gideon. Do not fear. You shall not die. In the very midst of our weakness, in the very midst of our failure, in the midst of what is often our ignorance, even our arrogance, God often, doesn't He, comes to us with grace and mercy and love and compassion and pity and peace. Even now, in the preaching of His Word, we get that, don't we? Or do we deserve it? We deserve it. No, we don't deserve it. God is gracious. Make no mistake, the furnace of God's wrath burns against the wicked and against the ungodly. But there is grace and peace to be found in His forgiveness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Flee to Him for peace and mercy. Verse 24, So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord, and he called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it is still in Ophrah of the Abiah's rites. Brothers and sisters, we need to build the same altar with the brick and mortar of our redeemed lives in our own hearts for the Lord, right? Have a triumphant memorial set up there called the Lord is Peace, and we need to live our lives in light of that 
memorial to him, right? Trophies of his grace. The Lord is peace. All praise, honor, and glory to the one who has granted such peace through his son. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we are so grateful for your loving kindness toward us in Christ. Thank you for this picture of your patience and your compassion and your pity, even this beautiful offer of peace uh, to Gideon here in Judges chapter 6 and how that uh, warms our heart. And uh, we see in you, Lord, such uh, mercy and grace and loving kindness that far be it from us, Lord, to flee from you in slavish fear, but to cling to you for your uh, salvation, the salvation that you freely offer in your Son, and having freely offered him up for us all, how much more will you also freely give us all things? We love you, Lord. We're grateful to you for your compassion on us, your pity towards us. We need your mercy. We are in desperate need of grace, and we're grateful to you, Lord, that we have it in Jesus Christ. And your word promises it to us. It assures us of it. We have your word, and we trust in you. Put all our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here who's not turned from their sin to do that, Lord, show them the foolishness of their way, the stubbornness of their own heart, the rebellion they've displayed against you, and break their heart over their own sin and turn them to the Savior. For those of us here, Lord, who've turned from our sin to trust in Christ, uh, build us up in our, in our faith as you are doing for Gideon here. Lord, help us renew our love and devotion for you according to your word through the example here that you've given of Gideon and how we see ourselves in, in his position often and how desperate we are for love and grace and mercy and forgiveness and patience and kindness and pity and peace. And help us, Lord. We love you, we're grateful to you, Lord, and thank you for this time together in the study of your word. Apply these things to our heart and mind for your everlasting praise and worship, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.